last week we covered um till section 11.3 so um, but today we'll cover 11.4 and 11.5 which is basically passing a file and um so for 11.5 well and 11.6 it's writing to a file and lastly we'll cover other types of data yeah. and then now the examples Okay, so it is 8.05, sorry, um, I think it's 12.05 where you are. <laughs> um, so let's start. Hi, everyone, again. So for today's discussion, we'll cover um, the remaining part of this particular chapter. So we'll start with the first section, which is passing a file. So here you can ask yourself, how does read R passes a file? So, and that takes us to learn two things. We'll read how read R automatically guesses the type of column in each, so the type of each column, and um, also how can we override the default specification. And this is the strategy that read R does. It's that it will read the first 1,000 rows, and um, it will use some, like we, last week we learned of a new word, heuristics and we understood that this is like set of rules so red r will use the first thousand rows um yeah you sorry you will use the first a thousand rows and it will use some set of rules to find out which type of column this, we can also um repeat the same process with with a character so you have to specify a character in this function which is the guess passer the guess underscore passer function and this will re return reads our uh, best guess and we can also use the pass underscore guess function which will guess the which will which uses guess that guess that you have the, the particular guess we have found in this function to pass that to pass the column so you have this is an example where we have this particular date if I want to see, if I want to pass it such that we, it returns a bit, you have to enclose it in um, quotes because we are saying that it has to be like a character vector. So we see that if you do this, this returns get, sorry, bit. And um, if you look at this, this is 15.0, sorry, 3 p.m., 3.01, so it will return time, as you can see. And also this other example where we have it, it returns a logical statement. 
see if we enclose this one, five, and nine in quotes such that the characters, it will run double. Okay, so if I want to check, I, I can also use, remember we've mentioned about the pass underscore guess. So if I do this and I check its structure, we see that it will return this date and uh, this is the format. What I didn't understand so well was the, the difference between the two. <laughs> um, okay. So this is what happens in the set of rules. It's that um, for each, so if, if we contain F, T or false and true, the those set of rules will 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 match it as a logical. If it does contain only numeric numbers, in um, so it will be an integer. And if it contains only valid doubles, like we have this this four point five times exponential raised to power five, we negative five. Sorry, we have it as a double, and so on. So we have. If it's a number, the stopping rule will be a number if it will contain valid doubles with grouping mark inside, and it will return time if it matches the default time format, and it will return date if it matches the default date format, and it will return the date time. Um, any this is like a code that is used for dates. This is the standard we, we learned about this um, for the date, so it will return this type, the date time. And if none of these rules do apply, and then the columns will stay as vector of strings. So we, with this, we'll expect some problems, and these are the two problems. So this is because we, the defaults do work, don't always work for large files. And the, the two basic problems include that the first 1,000 rows might be a special case, and our read R tries to guess the type that is not sufficiently general. If, for example, you have got a column of doubles that only contain integers in the first 1,000 thousand rows, so it means that it will, it will tell you, it will pass it as an integer, yet uh, below the 1,000 rows, we have it as double, as doubles of the numeric. The second problem is that uh, the column might contain a lot of missing values. So perhaps the first 1,000 rows only contain uh, the NAs. So read R will guess it as logical vector, where else below the 1,000 rows, it could be their numbers. Um, and you want to pass it into something else, as something else, more specific, unlike um, the, logic, the logical vector that has been passed because the first 1,000 rows do contain the NAs. So it's worth to note that read R contains a challenging CSV file that we will use to illustrate these two problems. So this function read R, it, this read R underscore example, it's basically the, the function that we use to call, to like find the specific, where the file is. So we use this read R underscore example. And um, if we call it that, we see that we have warning here that a thousand passing have passing fails. And we, we saw such from last week where we have got the rows. So it tells us this is the first row. The, it's checking a thousand. So this is 1001 and so on. So it tells us the column, tells us column Y and what was expected, what was actual and uh, where the file is. Okay, so like I've mentioned, this the use of read, uh, read R underscore example, it helps us find the path to which, which file is included with the package. So here we can, we want to, 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 two outputs have been printed out. As you can see, we can see the, this, we have this, the column classification, and then we have this. So we have the column classification that is generated by the first 1,000 rows and also the first five passing failures. You see these are 1,005. Sorry, from 1,001 till 1,005. Those are what have been printed out. So for us to have a good idea of what exactly, what problems are, oh, sorry, what, uh, what 
passing have failed. And then we use this function problems that we learned last week to explore them in depth. And uh, we see that it returns a table with, um, well, because it's a table, it will print only the first 10 rows. And um, we can see that this is, this is basically what we had seen previously. It's only that now with this, it tells us what problem is. So the book suggested a very good strategy that it's best to work column by column until we don't have any other problem existing. So in our case, we see that there are a lot of passing problems with column Y. If we look at the last few columns, so let's look at the tail of the challenge, look at the tail, um, the tail of the challenge data sets. This, the tail prints out the, the last six rows and we see that, um, okay, I didn't include. So we see that the, this, the, the, the last six rows do contain the logical, um, sorry, do contain the NAs, the missing values. So the, the, um, it is passed as a logical statement. So how can we fix this? We see that for Y, it is expected as the, it's actual a date, right? As you can see, it's actually a date. But here we have like the, the last six rows as NA. So how can we fix this? We can fix this by start, by start by copying and pasting the column specification into the original call. So this is what is done. We have the read, we have seen the read underscore CSV. And then in, when we open the brackets, we use this function to call this particular challenge.csv file. And um, the next thing we've said that it's to fix this, the first thing we start is by, we, we copy and paste the column specifications. So here we have, from here, we've seen that the column specifications is that X is equals to call underscore double and Y is equals to call underscore logical. So we do that. We do that here. And, um, once we do that, so we first start by we first start by fixing the type of the column of y by specifying that y is a date column, unlike how it has been passed as um, logical statements. So we, we we include the we include the call this the the call column specification, and um, if you do that and you look at the tail. And then we have it as dates. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I am. I. I didn't understand how the N is. How we moved from where we have N A into the dates. Will anyone know? Uh, I think you have, uh, uh, this is why, this why uh, call types is called date. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the, the, the Y colon uh, would be recognized as a date format. So in fact, is uh, that was uh, like in uh, a date format. So it has basically recognized as a, the format you have uh, uh, mentioned it uh, above in the challenge uh, um, call J no no just uh, mm. just uh, uh, here there is um, where where tails challenges a bit uh, uh, here you see you, no um, in the last bit uh, here you see that there is y mm -hmm. equals to call date and this is date instead of being double and uh, before was logical. Now it has been, has been defined mm -hmm. as a date. So he just has recognized the, the column as a uh, behind in a date format. Fe Federica and Lucy. Yeah. So I've got a question. So Federica, as we read in the data, the first 
uh, steps, the first function we were having it called as logic. Uh, and so therefore, as it was interpreting that CSV file column Y, it was saying this isn't logic, or sorry, this isn't logic, so we're putting it as NA. If we change the function in the second group and, and categorize it as date, then as it reads the CSV file again, it would recognize that, that format then, correct? Exactly. So it's not, you're not, you're not mutating or removing any of the NA values like is NA. You're not doing any of that type function. You're just telling the uh, parsing program, the, the, the read CSV and then the read our example, you're telling it what format that column is. So then it, it's able to recognize that uh, format and then uh, correct your, your, your read R function. Am I stating that correctly? Yes, exactly. Yes, that, okay. that's correct. Okay. Ah, thank yes, you. I have a follow-up question to that, but if reader is supposed to guess, right, from looking at the first 1,000 rows, why is it not guessing that that is a date? Why, is, why does it think it's logical? Or did we specify that in the, in the reading of it? it, it okay. Sorry, I'm just confusing. No, no, I think you're answering or you're asking a great question. I believe because we explicitly state column types and then we're specifying what that column type is, we're getting an error passing a logical value of expectation, but we're getting a date format. So the, the system, the, the read our function is following our command of, of interpreting as logic, but that's not a logical value. So we get NA instead. Right, that then, makes sense, but I thought that we did okay. not give it the call types. I think the, only if you, uh, there's a sentence in our section, Lucy, if you don't mind me. Uh, I found it in, uh, uh, I'm using the book, I apologize. Um, it's, uh, it's under the heading problems and it's the last paragraph. Uh, if you have the book open, Sandra, um, yeah, the last, it says, I highly recommend always supplying column types building up from the printout provided by read R. Uh, the, this ensures that you have a con, uh, consistent and repro reproducible data input import script. If you rely on the default guesses and your data changes, meaning the CSV that you're interpreting changes, um, read R will continue to read read it in. If you want to really, uh, if you want to be really strict, use stop for problems. So I, I, I believe what the author is stating here in that paragraph is that if you don't explicitly call out the column types uh, sub menu option, then it is going to do that heuristic uh, uh, guessing framework, right? Exactly. In this example yes, that Lucy does. is presenting, we're using the column types explicitly telling read R what expectation we're uh, uh, wanting our CSV to be. Do you understand how I'm splitting those two, Sandra? In, in one example, I'm saying don't use the, re uh, don't use the column types sub menu call, it would use the heuristic guessing function. If we add that column types, then we need to uh, expressly tell read R what those column types are. Yes, basically he, 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 he guess it at, uh, at the beginning, it give it us a done with these two type of uh, columns. And then if it's not, you need to specify differently. Okay, got it. I, I just not, don't see an example where uh, the call is made without specifying the column. So I, I think that that's where it was confusing, but that makes sense. Okay. Okay, thank you so much Fran, for that. Now that makes sense. <laughs> so here we state that um, every, this pass XYZ function is corresponding to the call XYZ um, function. We use um, the pass underscore XYZ function when we call, when the data is in a, char is in a character vector in R already, but we use the call underscore XYZ function when we want to tell R how to read, uh, sorry, when we want to tell the read R function how to load the data. Ah, okay, like what we did up here. Okay, so we have been informed to always use um, what Rian has told us, the call underscore types. This will build up 
the, the sorry, we'll building up from the printout provided by Read R, which ensures that you have a consistent and reproducible data import scripts. That so if you rely on the default guesses and your your data does change, Read R will continue to read it as it is. And um, lastly, if you want to be strictly, um, you can use the, this function the stop underscore for underscore problems. And this will throw an error and stop your script if there are any passing problems encountered. So other strategies that we can do is that first, um, like in the previous example, we just got unlucky because if we look at just one row, then the default, and then we can correctly pass it in one shot. So here is we add, like we say that we want to look at one, so the guess maximum to be, instead of the 1000, we change it to, like to look at one more row, which is 1001. And um, when we run it, we see that it will give us the column, two outputs, that is the column specification. And um, so this, we see that it will, it is giving out correctly as a date and like what we had previously as um, a logical state, uh, like a logical uh, vector. Sometimes it's easier if we diagnose the problems, if we just read in all the columns as character vectors. This is one thing um, John told us last week. So we have, we read another, we read the, CS, the challenge CSV file and uh, we add the call underscore types and we read everything we put here, such, we, we put the columns to be read as the call underscore character. So the default to be that, so that it's a dot and then default is equals to this. And um, if we read, if we, 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 we print it out, we see that X and Y both are characters and um, so um, the, as I understood, it's that the passing has succeeded for this case. It is also useful to use um, the type underscore convert function in conjunction to the, this, the call underscore types. And this will apply, it applies passing heuristics to the character columns in a data frame. So we have an example here, we have a small data frame with columns X and Y. Uh, we print it out and then we look at the type underscore DF. We see that this will print out the column specification and um, it will also print out the table, like the table, the table object we have, we have, we have inputted in R. Okay, so if we have got very large files, it's best to use the, to set N underscore max to like a smallish number such as 10,000 or 100,000. And this will accelerate your iterations while you eliminate some of these common problems you've seen. If you have major passing problems, sometimes it's easier if we just read into character, we read it as, sorry, we read into a character vector of lines with this function read underscore lines or even a character vector of length one with the read underscore file. Okay, so with this, we can note that we can use the passing string skills that we have learned earlier to work with this. Now, since we'll be having, all of them will be characters. So we have learned how to import data, how we can pass um, different objects the data types and now we, can, we have also learned how to pass a file so let's see how we can write out our file and save it to a local machine so since we have been studying the read underscore csv so we can use the write underscore csv and also this the, the write underscore tsv so these two functions both increase the chances of the output being read in back correctly it also used the it always used the encoding string in UTF-8, and also it will save dates and save date times in the standard format as we learned, so they can easily be passed elsewhere. So suppose we want to export a CSV file as to Excel, 
we use this function, the rates underscore Excel underscore CSV. And this rates a special character um, called a byte order mark at the start of the file to tell Excel that you are using the UTF-8 encoding. So for this function, the most important arguments are two. Firstly, the, the, the data frame we want to save, that is X, and the path of the location we want to save it. We can also specify um, how missing values are written with NA, and we can also append it to an ex existing file if we wish to. So we let's um, save their like sorry, let's write the challenge data set. So we, we write underscore CSV. So this is the data. That is the name of the data that you have. And um, this is the name of the data. And uh, we write it as the challenge.csv. So we can note that some information is lost when we save it, when we save to CSV. So let's see this. We have, this is the challenge data set. It's a table with um, 2,000 rows and two columns as we see here. But then let's write it as a difference and see the difference. So we have, this is the, the data set, but now we call it as right, we, we give it a different name, challenge two, to see the difference. And if we read this challenge two CSV file, we see that uh, firstly we had, remember here, it, we saved it as a date rate. And um, if we check, if we just read the CSV file for this second file, for us to see the, diff the, the challenges, we see that the Y has changed to now the logical, um, the logical data type instead of dates. So with this, it makes CSV to be somewhat unreliable for catching iterim results. That is, we need to recreate a column specification every time you load it in. So for that reason, two alternatives were suggested. You can, we can use the write underscore RDS and uh, the read underscore RDS function. And these are uniform wrappers around the base function of this base functions, the read RDS and the save RDS, the capital. So these two functions will store data in our customs bin uh, binary formats called the RDS. So let's write it out. So we have got the write underscore RDS challenge, and this is what how this is how we want to save it as challenge.rds. And if we read it, we see that um, the data types have been they've been maintained. So we have X as double and Y as the dates. And like earlier, where we saw that with read underscore CSV, after you have written it out, we see that it's, it is now back to some of the problems we have discussed above as Y is logical instead of a date. So the second um, alternative is that this the feather package which does implement a fast, a fast binary file format that can be shared across programming languages. So we call it um, the library feather and we write it out. So write underscore feather function. This is the data frame that we want and we call it as this. So challenge dot feather. And if we read, um, if we, if we read, if we want to import it in R and then we use this read underscore feather function and we see that this, it still maintains the type of the columns as we expect. So we have X as double and Y as dates. So what to note that the feather tends to be faster than RDS and it is also used outside of R. So this R, 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 sorry, RDS do support list columns. So this, please note this, we will read more about this list columns when we're talking about models, but feather does not. It's just worth, so it could be, um, 
um, the feather function, the feather package is better as compared to the RDS. Sorry, okay. RDS, yeah. So the uh, feather package, why? Um, so what is the essence of it um, in R? In, I don't understand. For instance, if I have a file, I can write in this, um, so it in CSV, right? And I can read CSV in any program, right? Uh, sorry, apologies. Uh, we didn't understand the word. Hello? Zero. Hello? With, uh, hello, can you hear? Yes. We didn't understand anything at all. Can you hear me now? Uh, it's a bit like, I don't know, uh, there's a background noise. Background noise? Hello? What about now? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, okay, a little bit better. Um, Thanks. What about the other members? Okay. Yes, right. I can hear you. Okay, what about the other members? Can you hear me? Um, yes, we can hear you. Okay, um, I mean, it's, it's still not um, easy to listen to me. So the question is, um, the feeder package, um, for example, now if I have any my data set, I can write it as CSV, right? Write CSV, and I can use it maybe outside any other program language, not Python R or Python. So here, why the feather packet? What kind of advantage it does have here um, over the write underscore CSV? I'm just thinking this on top of my head. Why do I need to use it? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, the only thing that I, I can think of is it probably preserves the column types in some kind of a binary format, whereas the write CSV will not, even though it is readable by other systems. Mm. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I, I would think that that would be the difference. So to preserve the column types so that you don't run into those parsing errors, you can either use that write RDS yeah. Um, which is R specific, or this feather, which is, you know, for for any system. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm I, I'm just that's just my guess. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I would also agree like that. That if if we look at, so we the same we are looking at just look at what what is happening. We have saved the challenge the challenge CSV file as and read it again and now we see it that if you look at the column specification we have as y which we expect it to be call underscore date but for this case we have got call underscore logical but now if we use if we use the functions the read underscore um the read underscore rds given that we had saved it as our, our rds um file we see that if we read it it can still the, the Y is as what we expect, even though it has got these missing values here. It's as we expect. And the same is for for this, the read underscore feather, given that you have saved your file as this with the feather extension. So uh, what I understood from the book is that with CSV, well, with CSV, we see that some information have been lost. So the information, what, whatever that we did um, in the previous section, it has been lost. So it means that now we have to, to do that again. Now we have to specify the, col the column of Y as not as call underscore logical, rather as call underscore um, bits. But this has been solved with these two packages. I hope that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Awesome. So we, we have been discussing about the, the CSV files and um, basically the CSV files can, whatever that we learned about the other files, we can apply the same knowledge to it. But what if we have got some other extensions? So we have, if you have got CPA, SPSA, sorry, Stata or SAS, SAS sorry, we can use the Haven package. We have the read Excel which reads the Excel func files, that is the both with the extension .xls and .xlsx. There is the BBI, and um, this is used along with database specification, specific backend, 
this the r r my sql this the r sqlites and so on which allow us to run the sql queries against a database and return a data frame if you're dealing with hierarchical data the above was for rectangular data but for dealing with hierarchical data you can use the json lights which was created by oms for json files and we have the xml to package to read the xml so we have got a very excellent examples that have been worked out by G jenny brian in this particular link and if you also want to look at other data files other types you please refer to the r data import or export manual and there is also a package that was suggested called the rio package and um, with that, and with that, we can discuss the questions. Okay. Hey, Lucy, it's Ryan. I yes. wanted to, uh, I wanted to comment to the team as a whole. Um, one of the the key elements that I learned early was expect any information in any form at any time concept, right? So uh, we can't specify to our end users what format they're going to provide information to us. So the wrangling skills of, of being able to read that information, parsing that information, et cetera, we may have to create uh, these very eloquent uh, 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 styling of, of being able to parse or ingest particular data. What I was expressed, uh, expressing this comment to is Excel uh, format particularly. Um, I ran into a, a minor problem and I haven't found a direct solution yet. I just, I'm aware of it and I have to kind of uh, uh, roll up my sleeves and, 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 and really get kind of dirty and, and dusty trying to, to polish uh, this particular column. But um, Excel as a service allows users to uh, enter a new line inside one cell. Well, in when you read or transpose that to a CSV file or read in that CSV file, uh, it puts quotation marks around media. And so sometimes that quotation mark will cause some really funny things to happen <coughs> when you're uh, parsing from a Microsoft Excel format into a CSV file. That read Excel uh, option does allow you to have a little bit of control in how it's reading it, but you're still reliant on that Microsoft Excel format, that SLX or, I'm uh, sorry, S, SLX or SLSX. I keep messing those two out. Uh, one is XML formatted and the other one is not. But the, um, the point being is that read Excel uh, is an option if you have fairly clean data. If a human touches it and starts to do some funny things inside the cells, uh, you would probably expect some, some errors from that file. Uh, so just to the team as a whole, um, if that is an option that you may be dealing with in the future, uh, just be uh, be aware of it. Um, I, I try to be careful with Excel files. Uh, it's a what you see is what you get type concept, and humans are really bad about messing up uh, a automated computer type system. Mm. Right, and what exactly what you're saying that people can you can enter data in a cell like because I well, deal it's, with it's, a lot, and so I would yeah. want to know. I'm, I'm referring to like breaking lines. So like if you enter, oh. like just say a sentence, right? So let's do uh, some sediment analysis or some kind of a, a textual type analysis. We have a string uh, okay. inside that cell, right? Yeah. And within that uh, character vector inside that one cell, if uh, users will do an alt enter, which means that it breaks the line and puts it on a new, new row inside the cell, um, oh, that's cool. not okay. technically normal. And so I'm always uh, uh, trying to be at least uh, uh, giving advice to our staff members, please stop doing that. That's actually really bad. Um, and and it, it, it just makes the ingestion pipeline of reading that Excel uh, format into any other data frame or, or, or format, it just makes it really kind of ugly to, to add another uh, uh, function inside your call to ingest. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm. just to accommodate that. Right, okay, okay. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Luckily, I, I don't deal with that. I'm, it's mostly numbers on spreadsheets. But um, I guess the other thing, and this is because, you know, I'm such a newbie at this, but um, 
I always have trouble importing things because for some reason, you know, something just doesn't import. So there's also an import data set, you know, function right on the on the RStudio IDE that will tell you exactly which of the functions to use. And so sometimes I, I just get frustrated with, you know, looking for things and the import data set will, you know, show you the preview and, you know, give you some options to take in or whatnot. And so um, that I was just taught in one of my, um, it's like a, a Berkeley course. And they were like, you know, don't sometimes don't fiddle with things, just get the data in in whatever way that you can, even if it's like cheating, you know what I mean? Because yeah. it, it, it's very helpful. So I think that, I to that put it out there. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, that's a great comment. I think the import function is a GUI interface. It allows the user to uh, kind of exactly. see what R is is managing in, in ingestion and then uh, instead of doing direct command lines or column types or all the, the uh, information we, we've just covered, Lucy just covered in this chapter, it allows a more GUI selection of uh, kind of testing how you want to manage that ingestion path. Uh, that's a good point, Sandra, great comment. Yeah, it's it's really like saved me a lot of headaches. Like that's how, how I learned that there there was a read Excel and I was like, oh, great, you know, so this is this is fantastic. Um, Okay, thank you both. It was an interesting, I didn't know that about the Red Excel. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, so we have got two exercises for this particular chapter. So the exercise one was for the section um, 11.2. And um, so here we were looking at how we can import different um, data files. Mm -hmm. So the first question was, what function would you use to read a file where fields were separated with this, this bar, straight line? And so the solution is, remember we mentioned that the read underscore delimiter, we can, uh, we can read any file with any separator. We ought to specify with that the lim is equals to now this bar. And that is what we did. So we, apart from a file, we can skip and comment what other arguments do read underscore CSV. And uh, sorry, this is question two. Apart from file and skip and comment, what other functions do read underscore CSV and read underscore TSV have in common? So both of them do have the following arguments in common. We can, if we look at, I learned of this very new function here, called intersect. So if you look at intersect and then the names and the formals function, so we're looking at the read underscore CSV and the read underscore TSV, we see that these are whatever that is common. So file is common in both read underscore CSV and read underscore TSV. And so is um, even the very last one, which is skip underscore empty underscore rows. So these arguments have been described here they call the, the names, the call underscore names and call underscore types do specify the column names and how to pass the columns. Um, we have the local function which imports, which is important, sorry, for determining things like encoding or and whether the dots or comma are used as a decimal mark. Like we've mentioned that you can change it and we can we use the local function to change the defaults. And um, the NA function and quoted underscore NA do control which strings are treated as missing values when passing and so on. So let's look at the very last one, which is the progress do determine whether a progress bar is shown. So we can also use the identical function to see if it's as understood, it's that identical function is a logical um function that checks, it returns, sorry, a logical statement of either true or false. So if you look at the read underscore CSV and the read underscore TSV, we see that it, it's true. So it means that we have some, some arguments in these two functions that are common. The third question was, what are the most important arguments to read, uh, sorry, to the read underscore FWF function? 
um, we, we remember we mentioned, we said that we use this function if we want to read files with specific widths. So the, the solution is that this, the call underscore positions do, do tell the function where the data columns begin and end. So for us to have like the specific width, so we use the call underscore positions to tell the data to read, uh, sorry, to tell the, the this function to read the specific columns and not just everything. The fourth question we have is that sometimes strings in CSV contain commas, sorry, in CSV file contain commas. So to prevent them from causing problem, they need to be surrounded by a quoting character. They can be double quote or a single quote. By, but by default, the read underscore CSV do assume that the quoting character will be the double one. So what argument do we use in read underscore CSV to specify um, to, to specify to read the following text into a data frame. So we have um, this, we have the, this is double and double, but in the double, we have enclosed it as, we have enclosed it this, uh, the single ones that enclose the A comma B. So what we use for you to read this particular type of data is we use the read underscore the limb. And um, so we, first of all, we give this an object in R. So we, we call it X and give it this as an object. And now we use the read underscore the limb with the object that have created X. And now we, we put, um, we, 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 uh, sorry, just a minute. Okay. So what I understand is that we need to specify the delimiter. And in our case, we have, it is, you see, it's the, the we are separating with comma. So we have um, the quotes comma. And so what we use, we use the quote arguments. So we read X and now we want to separate these two columns with um, comma. So we use the function quotes. Like we, like we have seen, it's that the read underscore the limb can read any file that has different types of um, separator. And if we do so, we see that we, we have got two columns X and Y. And uh, X has got one value, one. And Y, it is two, the two values, but they have been enclosed in a car in these single quotes, as we see here. So we have got, it returns a table of the one, one row and two columns. But apparently this question is out of date. So if we use the read underscore CSV now, it does support the quote argument. So this, this should work. So you can use the read underscore CSV, um, the X as we have, and then we just put quotes and um, we, we want to have such that we have got X, we'll have, the, we'll have one and Y should have the A comma B. So we can put the quote function here and say, say that um, quote is equals to the double quotes um, into enclosing the single quotes. And if we do so, we see that it returns the, as what we have above. Okay, so we have the fifth question is that we need to identify what is the problem with each of the following in line CSV files and what happens when we run the codes. So we have, this is the CSV file. So we have A, um, B, and we are introducing new line, one, two, three, and uh, four, five, six. But if we run this, we see that we have got two warnings. Uh, row one and um, specifically column two and column, yeah, column two, we have got, it is expected to be three. We see here we have, we, we, we're only calling A and B. So it means that we only have two columns, but if you look at the values, the values are more than two. So definitely we'll expect um, a problem. So we do the same, if you see the same is here, we have got 
uh, read and ask CSV. So we have we have got column A, B, and C, and um, so we introduce a new line where we want. Uh, okay, so here we have got first one and two only, and if we introduce another line such that you have got two rows, we see that we have got more than the number of columns that you have. So here there are four. So we also have got two passing failures and we see it's column two and column four. And um, if we run the table, if, sorry, if we look at the results, we see that where we don't have a value, it is stated as NA. But now, yeah, where we don't have a value, it's stated as NA. If you look at this, this example, we have column A and B. We introduce a new line and we have only one. So we have got only one instead of, so we have got only yeah, one. Now, if you run it, if you look at the outputs, sorry, we have got A is a double and B is character. Yeah, because we don't have any other value for B, so it returns as NA. Would anyone understand where this the passing failures is happening? Is, is it that we have here um, NA, but now it is a double, yet it's meant to be a logical? Is that what it means? I don't understand where these passing failures are coming. <laughs> Can anyone shed some light? Okay. Um, well, we will see that you have specified uh, columns A, B, C, and what belongs to A is what just one and two, isn't it? So you have yeah. one and two, and then and then A, because the the second. Uh, um, So the, the NA is a little above the things that we were talking about. So yeah. just a little above, we were talking about this oh, NA. Oh, sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have ABC as a colon, and then the values, what are they? One, two, and then uh, one, two, three, four. The four is not anywhere. So yeah. one and two belongs to A and B, as well as the second line, one and two. The third, the three value belongs to C, which is not in the first line, in the first row, but just in the second row. Mm -hmm. So one, you, you have uh, input, uh, uh, two rows, the first rows with one and two, and the second row with one, two, three, four. Right, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. so the, the, the third value of the first row is not, the, the, you, you don't have it. Mm. So he, he has uh, uh, translated as an NA, because it has occupied a space, uh, it's building up a matrix of some dimensions. So the second row is one, two, three, four. So the, th the third value is not uh, anywhere on the first row. So it's an NA. And then there is no four because you have no value on the first row no mm. value in uh, and uh, so the so you say you should have put another another value for four as well maybe but you don't have the colon because you have just three columns so you miss also you also miss a colon that that is why the four the the number four is not anywhere and there is even not any an a Okay, I, I understand. Thank you. 
Yeah, that actually helped, Federica. Thank you. So if you had A, B, C, D, then the four should show up, right? On the second row. It should show up and it should put uh, also uh, one more an A on the first row because you yeah, haven't mentioned correct. about any four. All right. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. So we have another example here. For Lake of Sin. We have, we're expecting that we have two columns and we have only one value. So the rest is read, where, where we don't have a value is read as NA. And that is what we can see in the outputs as um, what Federica has well explained. So this is the other example. Um, I think due to time, we can discuss the first two and because I'll, I'll put this, I'll put this into this discussion, sorry, into the very big book <laughs> that we're using. So um, you can just have a look at it. So this is the solution which has really been explained well by Federica. It's that only two columns are specified in the header A and B, but the rows have got three columns. So the last column is dropped. Okay. So for exercise two, this was um, the section 11.3, where we were discussing about passing. So what are the most important arguments in the local function? And we see that we saw that these are the most important. We can change the date and time formats using the date underscore time names, the date underscore formats, and the time underscore formats. The other argument is time zone, which is TZ, where you can change the default time zone. Um, these are the numbers and um, also the, the encoding. Okay, so the second question is what happens if you try and set the decimal underscore mark and group underscore mark to the same character? What happens to the default value of the grouping mark? And when you set the decimal mark to comma, and what happens to the default value of the decimal underscore mark when you set the grouping mark to dot? So if the decimal and grouping marks are set to the same character, local function will throw an error. So this is as, as we see here, we have got the local function um, enclosed with, so this arguments, the decimal underscore mark as dots and the grouping underscore mark as also dots. And if we set the decimal underscore mark to comma, and then we set the grouping to period, yes, it's period, not dots. Yeah, um, this is how you do it. So you use the, lock, the decimal is equals to comma, and you enclose it with um, quotes. And if the grouping mark is set to a period and then the decimal mark is set to a comma, we, 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 do, the we, we do the following. So use the local function and the argument, the grouping underscore mark. And uh, you state that we are using the, the period. So we didn't discuss the dates underscore formats and the time underscore formats options to the local function. So what do they do? And um, can we construct an example that might be useful? So the solution is that these two functions do provide the default time and dates. And at the read R vignettes discusses that using this passes date, sorry, use, using this to pass dates. And this is because the dates can be, in, the dates can include language specific, um, weekday and month names and different conventions for specifying AM and PM. So if we just run the local function without putting anything inside, we see the defaults for the, all the arguments that can be, that you can use in this local function. And we see that for AM and PM, this is the format. And if you look at the months, you can either use it as January and, or you can write it as the short form Jan. The same for the days, you can do it as Sunday or um, you should form it as N, Sun, sorry. 
and um, we have the dates and score names. So this is and so these are the names that we have, we have seen. We also have the encoding, which is as we have discussed, the standard one. The time zone is UTC, the formats, and also the numbers. So let's have an example where we have. This is in French. We read um, the vignette of passing French dates. So we have its first January 2015. We have specified as we have specified our date as follows, and now we have to change the local as local uh, function, um, the fr. So it will be passed as a date. You can also change. You can also see that instead of using it as the full name. We have the fourteenth uh, October nineteen seventy nine. You see, um, we have if we change the local to fr, sorry, the the local into brackets fr. We see that it is passed as a date as well. Yes, so um, sorry to interrupt you because I've spent some time understanding this thing. And uh, you basically, when you pass date, uh, you specify uh, how, how is the date format that you are passing. And you are saying actually that uh, this is the format like percent sign day, percent sign month, uh, percent sign year. And then you say this is in French. You are not modifying anything when you say locale and then locale French. You are not modifying anything, but you just um, is instructing the the function about the type of date, how it's written. Uh, so it uh, has the the way to recognize it and then translate it, basically. Yeah. Yes, 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 I, I, I meant that. So th this you have to specify and also this you have to specify, but um, the local um, function, it will read this particular date, which has been written in French. Okay, so it's- Yes, because um, when you, this is up and when you uh, make data wrangling, uh, so you're changing the format of your, of your data, sometimes you just need, you, um, you just need to specify how your data uh, is, um, what is the format of your data? So this is, because sometimes it's confusing. You think that you want to, uh, you, you need to modify and say the way that you want the data be modified. Instead, you need to specify the date uh, in the format um, it is, basically, before then modifying. Indeed, yes. Um, I, I have a question, and this might be a, a dumb thing where I'm just getting confused, but we're on the first parse date, right, where it's in French, and it says 1 janvier 2015, and then there is that, um, whatever you call that symbol, I'm blanking out. Um, these, so that symbol D and then symbol capital B, symbol capital Y, right, those are not set variables that R understands, right? You are just giving some sort of a format because on the top line, you have a capital B. On the second line, there is a lowercase b, right? And then of course, when you set a custom thing, then you can give it whatever it is that you want, right? So it's okay. not like you have to give R like the um, percent capital B, and it knows that that is the month, right? So, Sorry if it's confusing. No, no, that's that's the um, uh, that's a specification that you find um, in the documentation of date function, mm -hmm. and you see that B capital B mm -hmm. uh, corresponds to the the month re mm -hmm. written entirely. So Janvier or um, uh, October or January, so written. Uh, ah, got entire. it. Yeah. yeah. B, um, not in capital letter, 
Uh, yes. it's, a, it's a short version of the, oh. the name, as you see. And there is um, uh, a sort of a codification language about this thing. You will find it in the date. I believe it's, that, it's in there, in the date mm -hmm. function uh, documentation. Right, right. Oh, okay, okay. So then, then I have a, a question uh, following that, Verica. When we're specifying the locale custom a little bit further down, and it says locale date format, right? So now month is giving us percent capital M, right? So why is it different from this capital B or is the B just for a specific locale? No, it's... Um... B, uh, capital B is for the, the month uh, uh, clearly written uh, uh, entirely uh, like janvier, uh, <coughs> October, entirely. It's not a yeah. shortcut, a short way to, to write the month. Okay. Um, so it, it is not local for French, uh, or, but it, it's uh, a codification of the, the, the date. Mm -hmm. uh, function, how you parse in date. Uh, for the, specifically for the parse yeah. date function, right? Okay. If you do M, mm -hmm. just a little M, it's just a month with uh, in, in, uh, in numbers. So like uh, zero, one. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, so then if we go further downward, they're doing the locale custom, right? There you can specify, I'm guessing, however you want, because you're telling that the date format is equal to, right? Day given as percent little d, and then the month given as percent m, or is that also telling that locale function that it's a specific encoding? Because then year is also given as percent little y. Okay, maybe I should I'm, 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 I'm responding, but I'm, I'm sure someone else does uh, know as well. Why uh, written in a low, uh, why the, the letter Y is written in capital letter means mm -hmm. the year uh, with four digits, like two, uh, two zero, zero, one, okay. for example. In, uh, uh, not in capital letter, so the Y, not in capital letter, means just the last two digits. Mm, okay, okay. Zero, one, so then, for example. What about month written as percent capital M? Uh, percent capital M is the, um, where is it? Uh, um, locale custom, yeah, locale date format. There's day and then month percent capital M. Okay, and this is a custom month, um, where is it? Okay, this is capital M. Uh, it basically, I don't know if it's uh, the same uh, definition because here we have a date time and this mm -hmm. is different. So this is time format date time, you see that there is second, minutes, this is minutes, this mm -hmm. is second, minutes is not a month, this M, this capital yeah, M. But, right, uh, so that's what I'm wondering because for the date format, it's also using a percent capital M for the month, but then for the time format, it's using that same thing, percent capital M for minute, or is it because you're telling it, that's how you want it? Uh, it seems uh, ambiguous. Yeah, it's ambiguous. I think it's ambiguous. Yes, okay. because I usually the the month is uh, the uh, low capital um, M, but here is you are doing custom. You are right. customizing right. them. Right. Okay. Yes. That you can you sense. can then change it. This this is what I spent time on understanding it because <laughs> you you are now changing it and that, that you can do whatever you want but, okay, be, okay. but, but before you need to specify it so he understand that it, it is a date and how 
uh, how is the date being uh, parsed, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then you okay. can that's, change. That's what I figured that that's why custom was different. And then you have, you know, instead of B or any specification of capital or lower B for a month, that is just using, you know, whatever you choose, which actually M makes sense for month in English, at least. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much for that explanation. That's very, very helpful. And sorry, I interrupted you, Lucy. No, your questions are very valid and they make me think. <laughs> so please do continue asking questions. Okay, so I think we have already um, discussed this as Federica has. So we, we can customize the date format and the time formats using the date underscore format argument and the time underscore format argument as however you, you please. So if we look at um, if we look an example using the local custom, we can see that if we pass it as a date. So wait, so we have got this example here, the date underscore custom. We have it's day one of Monday second and um, year zero three, and uh, this is the opposite. So we have got the day zero three, um, Monday zero one, and year zero one. But now if we try pass it as um, a date, we see that we expect it to have, um, we, we, sorry, we, we are seeing that we have got two passing failures. But now if we, if we, if we because now this is, this is not the usual format, so hence we have got the warning. But if you use the local custom as we had specified above, we see that it actually returns the dates. Okay, so that is the other example using the, the for the time custom as well, since we we had already customed our time format using the time underscore format argument. So the last question is if you live outside US, you create a new local object, then and cap encapsulates the setting for the types of the files you read most you sorry for the type of files you read mostly common so the solution is you can check the arguments so you can ch check more information about the local to um, the local using this the help function as we learned some few chapters ago and we see that we can learn about the different variables that can be set so as an example, we have, let's consider Australia. Most of the, most of the defaults we learned are valid, except for the date format. So the date format is as this, meaning that the January is written as January, um, comma, January 2nd, comma, 2006 will be written as the second. So this is zero two the sec date month 01 2006 but if we pass it we, if we pass this particular date we see that we should return an error and uh, it, it is passing it as february 1st 2006 the second month the first date 2006 but now we can use the local object to change that we can use the local object such that, so we, we you specify, for example, for the Australia, so Australia underscore local objects, we have the date format as this. And um, this is percentage D, um, forward, forward um, slash percentage M, forward slash percentage Y. If we use pass underscore dates with the this local that you have created, it will correctly pass our date, our example dates. As we see here, now it will pass it as what we see. We want 2006, uh, the first month, 2nd January. Some other, sorry, sorry about the time, but we're almost through. We have, what is the difference between the read underscore CSV and the read underscore CSV2 uh, functions? It's that. The delimiter is the um, the delimiter. We have um, the function read underscore CSV uses a comma, while 
the read the one with the read anastasis v2 uses semicolon this semicolon using semicolon is useful when commas are used instead when commas are used as the decimal points as in europe so what are the most common encodings in Europe and what are the most common encodings in Asia? So after doing some Googling, this is what we have. You can read more about it and see. There's other readings that have been suggested here. I made a mistake, it should be the other way around. <laughs> yeah, and um, so just have a look at that. The last question is you generate the correct format to pass each of the following date and time. So we have got this. So let's look at, for example, for day one, where we, it's January 1st, 2010. We can pass it as, as we have learned that for capital B, it's if we have it's been written with full, it's sorry, it's the full term, the full word, which is January. So we have it as if we pass it as it is, we see that it returns the date as we want. So you see, this is 2010, 1st January. Yeah, and then if you look at, for example, T1 with time 1705, for T1, we pass it as this. So we pass it as the hour, 17 being hour, percentage hour, H for hour, and uh, percentage M for the minutes. So if we pass it, we see it's giving us as what to expect as 1705. And uh, we can look at probably like this, the last question where it has even PM. And uh, let's do also, let's do first of all D4. The date four, we have got two dates. So we have August 19, 2015 and July 1st, 2015. So what we do is the year has been surrounded with brackets. So what I saw is that you can you surround the this percentage way with also brackets and it will pass it correctly. If you look at time two, where we have it's 11.15 and 10 seconds, 10.2 seconds, 0.12 seconds PM. How do we pass it in R? You do this percentage M, um, how the date has been separated. You see that it has been separated with colon, with colon. Yeah, and we have the very last one where we have this 10.12, it is passed as percentage zero S, OS, sorry. And at the very last one, which is the PM, we pass it as percentage P. And um, if you if you do that, you see that it returns the correct time as we have stated in our object. So these are the references we used. Of course, the solution came from this awesome um, link. And the course notes that I used is as this. Lucy, can you put yeah. those two references in the chat, please? Yes. Thank you so much. Okay, if we have no other question, thank you so much. I am way more confident <laughs> and like how I was when I started. So thank you so much for this awesome group. Thank you for your tutorial. Um, I learned a lot. I, I really enjoyed going into like nitty gritty of things and you know, thank you for everyone that answered questions. Great job, Lucy. Yes, yes, thanks for all the great time. questions. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Okay. I'm going to be back.